Welcome to the Rewilded Human Podcast, where Dr. Lucille and Lynn will tackle your most difficult and intimate questions with candor, tough love, and a little dash of humor. In today's episode... One thing for sure, if you try for another relationship, you're going to learn a lot about yourself. Even in trying for a new relationship, we can grow, we can heal, if that's our intention, much more rapidly than when we're on our own. You have to be very careful because whatever is in your mind will eventually manifest in your body. So, you know, when you're focusing on cancer and, and serious illnesses and things like that, eventually you're going to manifest those issues because, you know, your body doesn't know the difference between what's actually happening and what's happening in your mind. This does not make you a bad mother. Here's the discernment that you need to make, which is you still love your son undoubtedly, but you cannot stand his behavior. And that's the part I don't think you anybody should force you to love the behavior because the behavior is a horror. Welcome, everybody, back to the Rewilded Human podcast. And we are at episode number 42. I don't know where the time has flown. I'm Dr. Lucille, and this is my beautiful co-host and partner in crime, Dr. Lynn. And we are here to help you go back to the wild essence of who you are really meant to be. So we're going to just launch right in with our first question. Hi, ladies. After becoming a widow, I found it incredibly challenging to open up to someone new. The idea of building intimacy and trust with a new partner feels truly daunting. Any tips for trying again in life, or should I just give up and enjoy my cats and my grandkids? Thank you in advance, Laura. Okay, well, thank you, Laura, for this uh, really common question. Again, something I see fair amount in um, clients. You know, it's really difficult after you've lost a partner uh, to death because it, you know, you have so much to go through, right? And, um, you know, you have to deal with the grief and then you have to think about how do I rebuild my life? And it sounds like you do have some desire for another relationship, but, you know, it is, uh, I would agree with you. It's, it's a bit daunting I don't know how long you were with your late husband, but you have to really start. It's almost like starting life over again. First of all, because you are a conflicted, it's not like you're saying gun go, I'm gung ho to have a relationship right now. Uh, if I were you, I would just maybe sit with, you know, your f real feelings about it. And maybe the reason that one reason you're not gung ho right now is you still have maybe some more grieving to do. Maybe there are issues in the uh, in your marriage that you didn't get a chance to resolve or work through, and you are a little bit reluctant to have to get into issues with a, a new partner. Uh, maybe you haven't spent enough time on your own. And I think that's always extremely important when we end a relationship that we don't rush into another relationship. And however that relationship ends, that we do spend some time on our own getting to know ourselves again and looking at, well, what do I really want with my life? What do I really need to change up? What what am I what am I? really longing to do that I, I never had a chance to do while I was in my partnership. So there are a lot of questions here. And I don't think it's as easy um, to say, yeah, definitely, you know, start dating versus no, be on your own. Um, I would uh, guess from your question, that maybe you need some time to really delve deep into your heart and ask yourself, are you really ready? to either give up on the idea of another relationship or try, just go ahead and try. One thing for sure, if you try for another relationship, you're going to learn a lot about yourself. Even in trying for a new relationship, we can grow, we can heal, if that's our intention, much more rapidly than when we're on our own. Even yeah. if 
the new relationship feels like it's not going to work, you will have developed so much more self-awareness and uh, confidence, perhaps in dealing with another human being around close heartfelt issues. So if you want um, an ex more expanded life, you would likely try for another relationship. But if you um, really are much more wanting safety, peace, then you will enjoy your cats and your grandkids. Uh, but I would say to you, don't rush. Don't feel like you need to rush into anything and follow your own wisdom about where you're really at. Don't don't get hung up on shoulds. You know, I should do this or I should do that. This is time for you to really explore who you are and what you really want in your life right now. And I don't know, maybe deal with some leftover grief. I have no idea. But uh, Laura, thank you. This is a really, really good question. And a lot of people, I think, need to contemplate that when they've um, they've ended a relationship for one, one reason or another. So Lynn, what would you add to that? Yeah, yeah I agree with everything that you said, uh, Lucille and uh, Laura. My heart goes out to you. I'm truly sorry for, you know, for your loss. It's it's really difficult, you know, and I think about this at times as well. And, and I think about what I would do. And, you know, after being with my husband for almost 30 years, I can't even imagine like being with another man or having sex with another man or being interested in someone else or having someone touch me. I, I can't even go there, you know, in my mind. So I can't I can't even imagine how that would be. And I'm assuming you also feel the same way. But at the same time, you have this void in your heart, in your life that you want to fill as soon as possible because it's it's just this emptiness and that's a horrible feeling so yeah eventually that in that that emptiness can be filled with your grandchildren and your cats and friends and everything else with a social life but in the initially that hole is just it's like a crater just ripping you apart having said that i do know a lot of ladies who have gone through this and they actively decided not to look for another man and they are happy and they're fulfilled and they're traveling and they're living their best life. So, you know, I think both things are absolutely fine. Maybe it's not about actively, actively going out there and looking for a partner, but like Dr. Lucille said, you know, grieve for as long as you need to take care of yourself, find yourself again. And then, you know, if you slowly open up your heart, eventually, if there's somebody out there for you, that person will find you. I, I'm I'm so sure of that, you know, that we have these soul connections. And and if there is another soul connection waiting for you, that person will definitely find you. But in the meantime, yeah, definitely, if you want to go out there and start dating, it will be an experience and you will, you will learn new things and you will see how the world is now, how it has changed, and you will learn more, more new things about yourself as well. So yeah, it, it really is up to you. I mean, we understand that it's very hard to start over and to and to put yourself out there. But ultimately, if you feel like that's your calling, that's what you need to do, then then you then take the step by all means. So basically what Dr. Lucille said. <laughs> and and just to add that, yeah, people are out there and they're they're thriving and happy also on their own. So there's nothing wrong with either either. I think both are absolutely mm -hmm. fine. We just yeah, as, long find as, as long as it's right for you, Laura. Exactly. You as long as you, you're happy, as long as it's right for you. Maybe now you can do so many things that you weren't able to do before. And, you know, a lot of women do take advantage of this time for those reasons as well. So, right. yeah, thank you so much for your question, Laura. We really appreciate right. it. And let's see the next question. Dear Dr. Lucille and Dr. Lynn, my son is heavily addicted to alcohol and drugs. Despite everything my husband and I have done to help him and get him into rehab, he keeps going back to the drugs. He can be very disrespectful, verbally abusive, and even violent towards us and others when he's using. And he's been arrested for drunk driving, and he's not taking any responsibility for his behavior. Truthfully, I hate him. Does this make me a bad mother? Please help. Maria. Well, Maria, okay, as a mother, my heart is absolutely, absolutely broken for you. No, it doesn't make you a bad mother at all. And you didn't fail as a mother. And this is not your fault. And I really hope that you are not blaming yourself. Obviously, you are doing and you will do anything that you can to help your son. 
super difficult situation, probably beyond your scope of helping him. I mean, you know, if the rehab, I don't even know what to say. I mean, I can't even imagine like dealing with a verbally abusive and violence and, and, you know, having that from your own child, that is just, how do you, how do you even handle that? I think I'm going to throw it at you, Dr. Lucille, because I thought I would, I would be able to handle this, but I'm really not sure what to say. Yeah. Lucille, what would you well, think? I can, I can understand that it, any, any woman who's been a mother would just, her yeah. heart would break uh, yeah. to think about it. And I, unfortunately, uh, Maria, I see so many parents who are in this situation and it is totally heartbreaking. I, I, I agree with Lynn. This does not make you a bad mother. Here's the discernment that you need to make, which is you still love your son undoubtedly, but you cannot stand his behavior. And that's the part I don't think you anybody should force you to love the behavior because the behavior is a horror and you're never going to love that. And I can understand that you would sometimes feel hatred and anger. And we have to remember, it's not about the son that you brought into the world who I assume you loved so dearly. It's the behavior that came with the drug abuse that you hate. And so you should. It would not be logical in any way, shape or form for you to love that behavior. You are in a position now where you probably have to protect yourself yeah. from your son. And I have uh, a number of clients who are in that position. One woman, poor woman, her son is in his early 30s. And a few years ago, he got massively drunk and high and came to her house and vandalized it and terrorized her and her husband who were there alone and he was breaking oh windows God. and screaming curses and threatening and and you know they were paralyzed they had to eventually call the cops it was a horror show and he was uh he was arrested and when you see also your son doing things that could endanger another human being's life like if they're drunk driving and they don't care and sometimes they don't they get arrested and even after they sober up they justify their behavior or they um yell about how the cops are you know are unfair and they're out to get them and it's it's just amazing what what they can do people become totally out of control when they're under the influence of drugs and alcohol i think the main issue here is that not only you have to do something to protect yourself from your son or manage the situation in some way, but your guilt. And I think that it is really important that you get help with that. Here in Toronto, there is there are organizations, there's a, a wonderful self-help group called Hope for uh, relatives of uh, kids or uh, young adults who are uh, addicted. And they have a wealth of wisdom and strategies and uh, personal support. It, it's kind of a little bit like AA in that, you know, you, you when you go and you have an issue outside of your meeting time, you can call somebody in the group and get um, personal support for whatever the crisis is. And they're very, very good about being there for one another. I think that's a wonderful resource. I think there should be more of that in every city and every every area, just like AA. Um, and they are very, very supportive and reality-based in telling people, no, it's definitely not your fault. And you can learn strategies of how to communicate with your child, but you're not responsible for the choices that they make. You're yeah. just not responsible. I would say that you may need some extra, if you don't already have some support, you may need some extra support from uh, people who are going through what you're going through to unload that guilt because that guilt can be so erosive and it can uh, affect every part of your health and well-being if, if you feel guilty about how you feel towards your son. You need to speak to people who know exactly what you're going through because they're going through the same thing no that's a super difficult situation and I'm, I'm sure she has to be careful also with her finances and everything 
absolutely they can't leave just money anywhere and and stuff like that so yes yeah so did you have any other insights i i don't really i mean i don't uh, thank god I, I don't have any any kind of experience or anything with this type of situation i i don't even know how i would handle it i mean i guess the only thing you can do is just keep trying to get help for him and uh you know be there for him and to be understanding as much as you can and and to be kind to yourself and and not to not to blame yourself for his behavior yeah best of luck to you maria and and we hope we hope that this situation gets resolved and that your family finds some peace very very difficult situation so we're on to the next question from lorraine hi ladies i have been so scared my whole life about sickness and death I'm a total hypochondriac. Every sniffle, every twinge in my body sets me off on worrying that I've got cancer. I'm obsessed. I can't enjoy life while this fear is gripping me. What can I do? Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you so much for your question, Lorraine. The anxiety sounds absolutely horrible. I, I know people like this, and I was a little bit like this when I was younger. And I was almost obsessed because I was reading so many medical books and everything. I always wanted to be a doctor. So I was reading a lot of medical books and every single condition, disease, anything I read about, I, of course, had. So that was that was very dangerous for me. And um, and I do know, th thankfully, I was able to overcome this. And now I take great pride in being super healthy. And, and I'm always focused on, on the health aspect of my life and of my body. So I think once you kind of make this switch in your mind that I am like a perfect specimen, you know, super healthy and always guided towards better health and my truth. And, and when you find that peace inside yourself, then your body also responds to it. So you don't even get the sniffles or the small issues that might be triggering this kind of issue. And, and it's you have to be very careful because whatever is in your mind will eventually manifest in your body. So, you know, when you're focusing on cancer and, and serious illnesses and things like that, eventually you're going to manifest those issues because, you know, your body doesn't know the difference between what's actually happening and what's happening in your mind. But at the same time, if, if it's some kind of severe anxiety that is causing these symptoms, then it's the anxiety that we need to address and also the cause of the anxiety, which could be, you know, something that you're eating. It could be coffee, it could be a chemical imbalance, it could be hormones, it could be so many things that are manifesting as anxiety and then leading to these thoughts where you don't even realize where these thoughts are coming from. Dr. Lucille, what do you think about <clears throat> this situation? I'm sure you've had lots of patients like this. I, I have had uh, a number of them, yes. And uh, everything that Lynn has said, I agree with. And if you're finding that it's really hard to shake, like you're really, you've been trying and it's not going anywhere, I would definitely suggest that you get a psychiatric consultation or at least a consultation with a psychotherapist. Because there are a number of things that go into making up this kind of condition. It's not just one thing or another. It's like Lynn said, you have to also look at your lifestyle. You know, what, you know, are you are you eating the foods that are inflaming your nervous system that are adding to the dysregulation of your nervous system? But in my experience, usually there's also been a trauma that has led to this. And that's why it is really important that you see somebody who's well-versed in trauma therapy. Now, I have a, a client who has a long-standing issue with uh, this kind of anxiety, always worried about cancer. She's done much better over the years, but as we were working with her, it became so clear how much she was traumatized by the whole thought of death. Her parents came from a culture where everybody, the older people always talked about death and, you know, how they, oh, how they were preparing their monument for their grave site and, and they'd pass by cemeteries and go, oh, I want to be buried there and da, da, da. And they would talk in excessive detail about every ache or pain they had in their bodies and running from this doctor to that doctor. They were doing all this in front of their children who were scared out of their minds thinking, oh my God, I'm going to lose my parents. Uh, and another place that she learned this trauma around death uh, was in church, 
where, you know, in their Sunday school, they, the little, littlest children would be told to draw pictures of what life would be like in hell. Oh, please. And then they, then, and then they would get, a you know, lots of accolades from the priest for creating the goriest, most horrible picture of hell. And then they would go to the church service where the entire church was filled with what she called torture porn, which was, uh, you know, the, the pictures of Christ on the cross bleeding from all his wounds and in absolute agony. And people would be going on and on about how beautiful it all was. And even as a young child, she was able at least to validate herself and keep questioning and saying, there's something wrong here. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong here. But nonetheless, she was contaminated by this incredible fear and terror of death. And so she's had to do a lot of work on herself, you know, you know, trauma focused therapy, really, to uproot a lot of this. And she's much, much better now. So, uh, you know, it, it, she's she's very, very grateful. But we also, as Lynn said, we had to work on her diet. We had to get her into exercise training that was right for her. Uh, getting out of things, really stressful situations like a horrible work environment, all sorts of things. Yeah. To start healing. So while it's a journey, Lorraine, I would say go on the journey because you're going to start feeling better. And it may take a while. Uh, you don't mention how old you are, but it may take a while, depending on how long you've had this condition, for you to come out from under it. But, you know, invest in that time and energy. You can definitely heal from this. Can this be induced by medication? Well, if it's a lifelong thing, I doubt she's been on medication for that mm -hmm. period of time. Yeah. I, uh, I, I don't see because medications can, there are certain side effects that involve getting more anxious or more obsessed yeah. or more worried for sure. Mm -hmm. So yes, if you're, if you're on medications and suddenly you develop this obsession with death and all sorts of anxiety yeah. or worry, you look at your medications and yeah. see if they have those side effects. Yeah. If it's a lifelong thing, it's more likely to, to do with trauma early on. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Lorraine, we wish you the best of luck with everything. Because yeah. yeah. this, this, this is a horrible thing to live with your whole life. And, and we really hope that um, you will find the right solution. We know you will. Right, absolutely. And there is a solution. So take heart. There's always a solution. Don't give yeah. up. Don't give up. Yeah. Okay, we're on to the next question. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Lucille. My boyfriend and I have recently started living together. I need him to give me access to his phone and laptop so I can keep tabs on him and who he's communicating with. But he's refusing. He says we each have a right to privacy, but my last boyfriend cheated on me with other women, so I need to protect myself. So who's right, me or my boyfriend? Thanks, Chrissy. Well, Chrissy, um, this is also not an uncommon problem that a lot of uh, people face. It can happen at any age period. It can happen with men. It can happen with women. I've seen it in all sorts of contexts. So thanks for asking the question. One thing is that if you, if your boyfriend agrees to being under surveillance, you have to ask yourself, well, what's the long-term consequence of that and when does it end like when when will he be given the all clear and you can then have a normal relationship without him being under 24 hour surveillance you have to ask yourself that is it really him or is it you that's another really important question because if you're if you haven't healed from the trauma of your previous relationship you're then just acting it out on the next boyfriend. And he's and innocent. Not, you know, he, you, you can't he, assume he he's be, guilty. That's right. He may be the most angelic person in the world. And you're loading him up with your issue. So that's really not fair. So if you think about it, if it was happening uh, to you, like say you got into uh, a relationship with a guy, you really loved the guy, and he started demanding that, uh, you know, you show him every single uh, receipt 
for anything you've bought, that you uh, show him all your bank statements, that you, uh, you know, account for every new thing you purchase that you bring into the home. Why? Because his former girlfriend took him for all the money that he had. <laughs> well, I think I may have used this example in another episode. But that's anyway, a good one. No, that's a good one. I like that. And and you're you're looking gobsmacked at him. It's, but I would never do that to you. Well, it doesn't matter because it happened to me once and I need to protect myself and I am going to insist that I control your financial life and keep it under a microscope. So yeah. you can't do this to me again. How is it going to make you feel? Yeah. Is it not going to erode some trust? Is it not going to hurt? You know, you want to give your partners the benefit of the doubt when you start. Because that's the best way that you learn how to feel safe with one another, how to open up with one another, how to share your intimate, intimate thoughts and feelings. But if you're going into a relationship like it's a police state, <laughs> what are you North Korea. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, oh, my Lord. And the other thing is, oh, there you go. I love the red flag. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've been waiting to use it. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. You both have a right to privacy. And one thing that you might want to consider is, as I said earlier, you get over your trauma of the previous experience. You get over your trauma. Number two, you learn to develop your intuition and your judgment, and your communication skills. So that if you feel something's off between you and him, it's up to you to say something and say it in a way that invites a conversation, not makes it, not make him feel like he's been uh, accused and he's about to be sent to prison. You know, these are the basic skills that any relationship requires that, you know, if we feel something's amiss, we you know, consult with our intuition, we use our judgment and ask ourselves, is this something that I need to bring up with my partner? And then when you bring it up, you learn how to do that in a way that opens up a discussion, not makes not not to make your partner feel like they're the worst criminal in the world. Okay, yeah. so you want to develop yourself as a human being through this relationship. So, you know what, I would side with your your partner, basically your boyfriend, uh, and on this one, um, Chrissy, because the way you're going about it is it's, it's bypassing the problem, but it's not solving it. Yeah. Okay. Let me play devil's advocate for a second. What if Chrissy's boyfriend is like this in the corner, sitting for hours in the bathroom? You know, when she walks in the room, he closes the top of the laptop. What if he's one of those guys? Uh, that's when you start talking. Mm -hmm. that bring up the hard conversation and the unfortunate thing is I, I see this with especially a lot of women they're reluctant to get into conflict the possibility of conflict uh, they are afraid of abandonment or rejection or whatever so they put up with this kind of stuff way too long until yeah. it blows up and I would say the moment you start suspecting is the moment you start framing in your mind how you're going to talk to him about it. And and there are ta there are strategies in how to bring it up in a way that doesn't create an explosion, yeah. but that really starts dealing with the situation. And so even if you've brought it up in a very tactful, curious, non-judgmental way, and he's backing off or giving you lame excuses or, you know, just blowing you off, his behavior tells you something. Behavior Even if he's the language. The behavior is definitely a language. And then you then you have a problem. Yeah. Then you have a problem. And yeah. uh and then you have to, you know, ramp it up and not let don't, don't let go of it. Don't let no, go of it. I agree. I mean, with my husband, we we both have like the passwords to each other's phones, but we would never just go through each other's messages you know we have it because like for example if I say oh check something on my phone and he can check it but he would never invade my privacy by going into my messages and reading my messages I would feel horrified if he would actually do that and I would never do that to him you know we both respect each other and trust each other 
So I think it's 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 kind of nice that we do have that access if we needed to for whatever reason, but we would never you know, be like spying. Oh my God, who did you write to? I have a girlfriend whose husband reads every single message that she gets and listens to every voice clip. And I hate that so much because it's like our friendship is like done in a sense, because I can't have a private conversation with him. I will with her. I will never share anything intimate. Right. I don't want this guy reading it. It's none of his business. So I think it's really important, Chrissy, for your boyfriend also. He has his relationships, his family, his friends. And you know what what he's discussing with them is really not your business. And you shouldn't Absolutely. be reading that and going through that. And it's the same way with him. You know, you need to have your privacy. Even in this, this digital world, we should have that kind of privacy for ourselves. So I think that's really important. So I think you guys have, as Dr. Lucille said, I think you guys have some other issues that you need to deal with and you need to address. But ultimately, you know, if you're going to be blaming this guy because your ex cheated on you and penalizing him for that, he's going to be running for the hills if you keep pushing. So sure. if if he's yeah. a trustworthy guy, if he's a good guy, then give him the benefit of the doubt and and trust him. You can't you can't build a relationship on distrust, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you very much, Chrissy. Uh, you have asked a question that I think a lot of people are wondering about. Yes, yeah, very common, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. So that brings us to the end of episode forty-two. Thank you so much again for being with us, listening to us, rambling on. Um, we love <laughs> we love answering your questions. Please keep them coming. You can DM us. You can email us. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Please be aware that Lynn and I are here to provide insights, advice, stories that are for educational and entertainment purposes only. None of our content should be considered to be personal, medical, or mental health therapy. If you are experiencing a mental health or physical health challenge, please consult the appropriate healthcare specialist. We are here to provide the best possible content in an atmosphere of positive conversation and personal growth.